Hello and welcome to this special webinar from SPJ, a semester send off from Jorge Ramos, subtitled Journalism Needs You Now More Than Ever. I'm Patty Newberry, President of the Society of Professional Journalists Board of Directors, and I'm happy all of you are able to be with us today. I'd like to start first by thanking the SPJ staff, specifically our Executive Director, John Schertzer, who put together today's program. SPJ, as many of you probably know, counts nearly 6,000 journalists, journalism students, journalism educators, and friends of journalism as members across the United States. In a normal year, that is one not interrupted by a global pandemic, we produce a number of uh, programs at the local, regional, and national level. Uh, we, we host a number of contests and competitions. We have a robust legal defense fund. We advocate for quality and ethical journalism in a myriad of ways. Today, in this webinar, our focus is on you, media students and recent grads, and what you can and should be doing in the current climate to stay successful and optimistic. Our guest of honor is Mr. Jorge Ramos, the nation's best known Spanish speaking journalist. Mr. Ramos is the longtime anchor of Univision and host of its El Punto and Show Me Something programs. Engaging Mr. Ramos in conversation is Erica Carbajal, a fellow member of the SPJ Board of Directors. Erica graduates in June from DePaul University, where she served as president of the SPJ chapter, worked for Good Day DePaul, Radio DePaul, served as editor-in-chief of an online site called Odyssey, and completed an internship with NBC and Telemundo Universal in Chicago. Thanks again for joining us, and now I'll turn it over to Erica to get us started. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you, Jorge Ramos, for being here with us today and speaking on this. I know you're pushing through the pandemic and managing a lot of content right now, so we're really happy that you're taking the time and appreciate that. So first, I just want to start off by how are you doing through all of this? I know you mentioned that you're working, finding yourself working more now than ever. So how are you doing with all of this? Uh, thanks so much for inviting me. And it is so, so interesting that you're asking that question because I, I remember that before the pandemic, I used to tell students, don't ever ask the president or the governor or the mayor how are you doing? That's not a way to do it. But now with the pandemic, it's completely different. It is, um, we are on a human level that we've never seen before. So um, you're, you're right, I think I'm, I'm working more than ever. I'm doing three or four shows at the same time. Uh, three of them uh, on, on, net, on a regular network. And then I have a, a show on, on Facebook called Real America. And, and working more than ever. So um, th this is not normal. I, we have to understand that we are in the middle of a terrible crisis. This pandemic is something that we, we never expected. Um, but also at the same time, and then let me tell you right from the beginning, is the best time to be a reporter. I was telling you right before we started, Erika, that uh, when I was much younger, I remember that I always wanted to go to a war. Um, I wanted to become a, a journalist and thought that the only way to prove myself was going to a war. I ended up going to five of them. And I don't miss that experience at all. But it was very important for my career. Well, right now, I, I wouldn't describe this pandemic as a war, but I would say that it's defining who is a real journalist and who is not. Because while many people decide to stay at home and um, and protect their families, and which is perfectly normal, and that's what's required from us. At the same time, um, those reporters who are in spirit um, truly looking for the for the truth cannot stay at home. Have to be out. Have to be in the newsrooms. Have to be in the streets. Have to be in the hospitals. And that's what makes the difference between who's a reporter and who's not. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, the title of this conversation, we have it as journalism now needs you now more than ever. So what, why does journalism need a new wave of reporters right now? Where do they fit into this? Well, because we need the truth. We need to find out exactly what's happening. Um, the, the most beautiful thing through this pandemic is the solidarity that we've seen 
uh, all over the world. Uh, I, I think it was um, Dr. Deborah Birx who, um, after one of those press conferences at, at the White House, she almost cried when she realized that thanks to the effort of all the United States and all the citizens of the United States and all the immigrants in the United States, we were able to flatten the curve. Well, um, it's happening all over, the, all over the world. So it is very tempting to, to say, I want to help the government. Let me just help the president. Let me help the government in Mexico, in, in Turkey, in the United States to save lives. But our role, if we really want to save lives, is to question the government, is to make sure that the president and the advisors and the doctors are telling you the truth. And so this is the best time to be a reporter because it's a worldwide pandemic. Uh, there are many things that are not true. And our role is precisely to make sure that what they're telling us is the truth. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't have to, to, to tell you that, but I, I was checking on, on February 10th, uh, President Donald Trump said the following. Uh, it looks like by April, you know, in theory, when it gets a little warmer, it miraculously goes away. That's what President Trump told us on February 10th. And of course, he was lying. He was not telling us the truth. So our role as journalists, um, we, can, we can talk about that a, a little later, but um, we have to report reality as it is, not as we wish it would be, but to question authority. And that's precisely our role. So I think we have to, to put aside the temptation of saying, well, let me help the government. No, to help, because we're not working for any government. Our role is precisely to serve the people. Our role is precisely to serve the audience, not the government. Yeah, and I think that raises a great point now because we have so many outlets for information. There's so much more fact checking and accountability to be done now, perhaps more than ever. Um, and now we're obviously at a nerve wracking time to enter the job field for anyone, but particularly for entry level and in journalism, um, you know, I, I, when I scroll through Twitter, I see people being laid off their newsrooms and all their tweets about that. So to prevent people from being so discouraged about, you know, that perhaps not being their first job or what can entry level journalists be doing to kind of move past this and tackle this? Let me tell you an, an anecdote and just so you can see the contrast and, and how, the way I see it, this is an incredible time to be a journalist, even if you don't have, you don't have a job in a, in a network or in a TV station, in a radio station or in a newspaper, um, because now you have social media. Now you can do whatever you want with social media. and You can have more followers, more people uh, listen to what you might say and watch what you might say on social media than what we do. On, on the networks. The, um, during the peak of the, the pandemic, uh, about a month ago, um, the number of people watching what we were doing on social media was much, much higher than any of our newscasts. And, and so, so you might be asking yourself if you're a student um, or you wanna be a journalist and you don't have a job, what can I do? Well, you have social media. You, you know how to use this phone much better than I do. And that's an incredible opportunity. So let me tell you the anecdote. I was working in, um, in Mexico City in the early 80s, and there was terrible censorship, direct censorship from the presidency, which was called Los Pinos, uh, to, to all the networks. And without the networks, nobody could say absolutely anything. Mm -hmm. I remember that I did a story on, on the authoritarian nature of the president and the network where I was working, they, they didn't want to hear that. So they told me, no, Jorge, you cannot, you cannot broadcast that. And so they censored me two or three times and, and the third time uh, fighting for that story, I said, you know, I cannot work here with you. And I quit and I quit. And, and I remember leaving the, the network, which was the largest network in Mexico and saying, what am I gonna do now? Because I had no opportunities. I wanted to be a journalist, but I didn't wanna be a censored journalist. But at the same time, I, I, I wanted to continue with my career as a reporter and I, I saw no option. So my option was to sell everything. I had a small Volkswagen, I call it Bochito. I got $2,000 and I came to the United States. 
And in the United States, uh, this country gave me the opportunities that my country of origin couldn't give me. But I didn't have the social, the social media. I didn't have any other possibility other than coming to the United States and finding another network. So I think you as, and, and, and all the students of journalism, even if you don't have a job right now, you have technology on your side in ways in which um, it, is, it is truly incredible. You can, I mean, I, I bet that if all the people listening right now wanted to send a message to anyone, that message would be stronger than many of the networks right now, as we speak. So I would take advantage of the technology that you have in your hands. I would um, concentrate on finding a unique angle so that your story and your perspective is different from, from others. And, and I would make sure that, that all your friends know what you're doing. This is the best time to be a journalist. And not only is the best time to be a journalist, it's the most important time to be a journalist because if we fail, people are gonna die. If we, if we don't do our job, people are gonna continue dying. And, and what's happening in this country I, I cannot believe that in the most powerful country on earth, we have more than 90,000 people dying because of coronavirus, and that we have more than 1.5 million infected by coronavirus. How come this is just normal? So again, it's ne the, the way I see it, this is the most important time to be a journalist, and it is on us to make sure that the president and the government and the doctors and that the mayors and the governors are doing their job. That's precisely what we have to do. Mm -hmm. and where do you think journalism as a whole, I guess the field is right now, and where do you see it in five to 10 years? We, we are in a, in a transition. Uh, as you know, I, I, I work on TV and I've been doing this. I've been an anchor for, for since 1986. So, so what I would say is that when I started working on, on TV, everybody wanted to be an anchor. So please let me tell you something. Do not be an anchor. Because what we need right now is not to be an anchor. It's precisely the opposite of being an anchor. You have to be swimming in all platforms. You have to go to places. You have to be able... To, to work probably on TV, but have a podcast and then have a presence on social media. Let me tell you something. I am absolutely convinced that without the presence that I have on Twitter, on Facebook, on, and on Instagram, without that, that I wouldn't have a job on TV. Because the most important thing right now is uh, to be able to live, to swim, to flow between, between platforms. So th don't be an anchor. And I think, I'm telling you that because that's, that's where the business is going. Some of my colleagues in the TV industry are in complete denial, the same way that people in newspapers and magazines were about uh, 10 years ago. Because we're seeing the audiences shifting completely from, from TV to the digital world, to, to social media. And, and sometimes, I mean, whenever, every, every morning when I, when I come to the office or when I'm checking my, my mail, I see, uh, I see two things. I, I check the content. I see, I see what's the most important story of the day. I'm trying to follow it. And at the same time, I'm, I'm seeing the ratings. And sometimes, Erika, what I'm seeing is that it looks like Martians came to Earth and took the audience away. It's, it's disappearing. Um, not every day. Sometimes it was fantastic. We have uh, millions of people watching about four months, four, four weeks ago or five weeks ago. But other days, when I see it, the audience is leaving, is not there anymore. And we know where it's going. It's going to social media. What do you do? The, what's the first thing that you do in the morning? You check your phone and you check social media and then you get all your information on social media. So that's, that's where I think it's going. So that's the technological part of, the, of, of your question. But, but the most important part of your question, I think, has to do with, with what it really means to be a journalist. And the ways is changing because of the pandemic. I'm sorry that I'm extending a little bit, but, but I think yeah. it's important. I think we have three very important roles as journalists. The first one is to report reality as it is, not as we wish it would be. So if 90 people die, we say 90. And if it's red, we say red. 
it is very important to, um, to be precise and make sure that your facts are correct. So that's the first role. The second role we discussed it previously has to do with questioning authority. If we don't question the president, if we don't question those who are in power, no one else is going to do it. We have to challenge authority. That's why we're journalists. Um, doctors save lives and architects create beautiful buildings and we ask questions. Our role is to question the president, even if he doesn't like it. And if he doesn't like it, I don't, I don't care. Um, and that's the second and most important uh, role that we have. And then after the pandemic, Erika, I've been, I've been thinking that that is not enough. We have a third very important role, and that is to serve a community. That is to give information that saves lives. And because I can be great at reporting facts, I can question the president and the governor and the mayor, and still I wouldn't be doing my job completely if I were not serving the community where I live. Um, and let me, let me just give you an example. Throughout this crisis, President Trump and the US government, for reasons that I cannot understand, they have decided not to um, designate a Spanish speaker um, spokesperson. There's no one who speaks in Spanish for the Latino community and for the 37 million who prefer to speak uh, Spanish and not English in this country. There's not a single website, a single website, Erica, that um, explains in Spanish the problems of the pandemic, what they should do, where they can get help. Um, as you know, the, uh, President Trump has decided not to, not to help the 10 million undo undocumented immigrants in this country, even though millions of them have children who were born in this country. So, so going back to, to my thesis, the third and most important role as journalists is to serve the community, uh, to give information that saves lives. So it is report the facts, challenge authority, serve our community. And if, and I, perhaps this goes back to what you're mentioning about social media, if journal, if news or reporting isn't a student or entry level journalist job, that's not their first job, what are ways they could still be connected or how can they use social media to, to make sure they still have kind of their foot in the door in the meantime while they're waiting? The, the idea of having a foot on the door is, is incredibly important. Um, I, I said the same thing 30 years ago and I keep on saying the, the same thing. As if, if you wanna be a journalist, if you wanna be a reporter, you, you just gotta be there and, and do whatever it, you need to do in order to, to be working for a website or for a network or for a radio station or for a newspaper or a magazine. It doesn't matter what you have to do. I, I still remember my, my first job in a radio station. Um, I was literally just taking paper from one reporter to the other. That, that was my job, papers. I was taking documents from one reporter to the other and waiting for someone to call me. Uh, I remember that the news director in, the, in that radio station, uh, he didn't like my voice. I have no idea why he didn't like my voice. He said, you would never be on the air. And I didn't care. The only thing that I really cared is that, um, that I was right there uh, with other journalists. Uh, th the most beautiful thing about being a, a journalist is that keeps you young forever and that you're always a rebel. But the most beautiful thing is that you are right there in the world finding and seeing what's the most important thing happening around you. My light went up, but it'll, it'll come back in a, in a second. Um, so uh, while, just, just a second. So while it is very difficult to, um, to find a job these days, I, I also have seen examples of journalists doing incredible job even without, without a job, uh, without a, a formal job. Um, there's, a, there's a photographer called uh, Aaron Alvarez. Um, he has only a few, a few followers on, on Instagram. Uh, and, and Aaron was doing another kind of job. 
And then as soon as the pandemic started, he started um, photographing the daily life of Mexicans in, in Mexico City. Um, and, and his job has been so important, so essential, that, that many other journalists are following him now. I don't think Aron is getting paid. I don't think he's getting a lot of money right now, but he's doing a fantastic job uh, witnessing and reporting what's happening in Mexico. And that's the best example that I, that I can give you of someone who might not have a formal job at a network or at a newspaper, but who's doing a fantastic job on Instagram and you should follow him. He's doing a, a, a great job right now. Also, I love what you said about journalism keeps you young. I have a sticker on my fridge that says, journalism will kill you, but it'll keep you alive while you're at it. Um, <laughs> well, the, 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 beauty is, the beauty is that journalism will always keep you young. I'm 62 and I feel that, um, that I'm learning things every single day. I, I, I'm becoming and we've become an experts on, on pandemics and on, on what's been happening in, in the world. In the, in the Middle Ages and, and how they responded to it. And so you are a little bit of a doctor, a little bit of a historian, a little bit of an astronaut. You're a little, a little, a little bit of everything. So it's, it's the most, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez decía que, que es la profesión más bella del mundo, no? Gabriel Garcia Marquez, the Colombian writer, used to say that it was the most beautiful, I, I think that would be the right translation, the most beautiful profession in, in the world. And, and it is because it keeps you connected with, with the world and, and also, and, and that, that is not enough, Erika. It keeps you connected with the world, but gives you the opportunity to transform the world, to change the world. Um, and I'm, for instance, a few, a few days ago, a CBS correspondent asked a question to, to President Trump. Uh, and instead of President Trump responding to her, uh, he, he insulted her by saying, well, ask that question to, to China. Well, the CNN reporter that was by her asked exactly the same question. And they were able to change the narrative of that day and they forced President Trump to, to end that press conference and get inside the, the White House. Um, by constantly reporting on the facts and making sure that if you ingest or inject yourself with disinfectant that that's going to kill you if we report about that we are changing the course of history slowly little by little and that's the beauty of this profession it's something that i i don't think we can find anywhere else in the world what areas of news do you think are growing or that that need more well definitely uh, it has to do with um climate change i, I would say it is probably not, not only essential for us right now, but our lives depends on that. Uh, what we are seeing right now with this pandemic is how, nat how little we understand about, about nature. I was reading um, the way they, they were facing pandemics in, in the Middle Ages. And the way we're responding to it right now is the most primitive way. It's exactly the same way they did it. In, in, in 1347 uh, to 1352, um, more or less, in, um, a, a pandemic came to Florence, which by then was probably the most beautiful city on, on earth. And the way people in Florence responded was exactly the same way we are responding right now, staying at home, keeping the social distance. Uh, the people who had money went uh, to the mountains and to the hills, and the people who didn't have money uh, had to stay on the streets and, and continue working. So, um, so going back to your question, I think um, climate change is definitely the most important issue facing uh, ourselves because um, our life depends on depends on it. And but but personally, I I'm, I'm always intrigued by power how people get power and how people abuse their power. Uh, so that's another area that I, that I would constantly um, force myself to, to look into, how presidents and dictators uh, abuse their power, 
and concentrate power. Um, and and it, is, it is very, very important. And finally, uh, has to do with, with technology. I, I, I grew up without a cell phone. I grew up without a, a computer. I grew up without a laptop. Uh, and, and technology is changing in ways uh, in which is, is transforming the way we, we report and look what we're doing. I mean, just this conference, it, it is amazing, something that it would have been impossible to think of um, just a, a few years ago. Right. And we know that there's, there's a lot of distrust in the media, and that's not obviously anything new, but now with the pandemic, um, and even before, it seems like there's a prominent kind of growing movement that kind of stands as a barrier for reporters just trying to do their job. And I think especially we're seeing it now with so many conspiracy theories everywhere. So what advice do you have for entering a field that seems so hostile today? Or was it always that way? No, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't always that way. And, and the difference is that social media and the internet has changed absolutely everything. Because um, a few decades ago, those, the only ones who had a voice were the ones in, in, in the media. And if you wanted, uh, and if you didn't agree with that reporter, if you didn't agree with that anchor or, or, or journalist, you would have to write to the network and then for his boss to read that letter and then the feedback would take forever. But the big difference right now is that through social media, that is an immediate uh, way of reacting to whatever you're saying. Every, every single day, I, I, people, tell, people tell me, hundreds of them, uh, what they think about me and not precisely the most beautiful terms. Um, and it is okay. I mean, I, I accept. Uh, criticism and it is it is normal it is it's part of my daily life if, if uh, people don't criticize me early in the morning when I'm checking uh, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram maybe it's it's because I haven't reported uh, lately so it is it is it is normal I'm I think it as, as part of being a, a reporter but but at the same time the, the most important thing that we have as journalists is our credibility. If, if I say things on the air, if I write things on Twitter that are not true, eventually people are not gonna follow me. And eventually people are gonna watch me. Um, as you know, I live in Miami. And, and every summer we have uh, a series of hurricanes. And I personally trust uh, two people in two local, uh, two local stations who tell me if my family is gonna be okay. I trust them. They don't know who they are. <laughs> I know who they are. Uh, and I watch them constantly to know if a hurricane is going to destroy my home, if I have to, if I have to move, if I have to tell my family that, that, that tonight we have to go somewhere else. Um, and the credibility is the base of journalism. If, if what I'm saying to you right now, uh, if people don't trust what I'm saying, it doesn't matter. It, look, it doesn't matter if I'm being criticized or not on Twitter, on Facebook, or on Instagram, it happens all the time. And, and by the way, one of the, the, the pleasure that I, that I get every single day is to block people who are insulting me or who are using words that are not needed to, to communicate their, uh, their message. But um, trust is the most important thing for us. If what you are saying as a journalist, Erika, uh, if people don't believe that, then uh, our job is done. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go to, we have a couple of questions um, sure. from, from viewers here. And going off back to social media, someone asked, what advice you have for building a social media presence as a journalist? Um, what have you learned in that area? And I think adding on to that, what, I guess if you don't already work for, you know, a news network or a newspaper, how can you grow that presence without the name of an organization? That's, that's the, the new normal. You, you have the, the opportunity 
you have a voice and and that's something that you that you have to um to be so proud of when um I'll, I'll get back to the question, but let, let me tell you a, a little story here. When I was when I was growing up, I remember telling my my dad um, that I wanted to be a journalist, that I wanted to study journalism, and I remember that he told me, "What are you going to do with that?" I remember exactly. ¿Qué vas a hacer con eso? Because for him, the only legitimate professions were to be a doctor, an attorney, an engineer, or an architect like him. But uh, my father was an architect, and he was okay, but he really was a great magician. Whenever he was doing his magic trick, his magic tricks at home, uh, he would come to life. But my father didn't have the courage to tell his dad that he really wanted to be a magician, not an architect. And I think he um, um, he was sorry for the rest of his life that he didn't have the courage to do that. Uh, he, sh he should have been a magician. And I learned from his mistakes. Uh, I, uh, before he died many, many years ago, he would watch my newscast in Mexico City while I was broadcasting here in, here in Miami. And I know that he was very proud of me, even though at the beginning, he thought that I, I was wasting my life. I was gonna waste my life as, as a journalist. I, I realized that I have a voice and I'm glad that I listened to that inner voice. So um, now you, you not only, I'm talking to all of you, uh, studying journalism or graduating or about to be a journalist or starting a career, you have a voice. Not only is your inner voice, but you have the possibility, the incredible possibility of recording a story, writing something, and tonight send it uh, on social media and maybe tens or hundreds and, and hopefully thousands of people would watch it, uh, would listen to it. So you, the platform is right there. So what would I do? Um, I, would, I would try to, to make sure, you, you might not think it's important, but, but I would make sure that you're doing a good job as a reporter. I had a boss. Uh, who, who would, we, we had a, we, we used to have a discussion on what the rules for social media should be for journalists. And he would tell me, well, in, in, a, in very simple terms, use Twitter the same way you use, uh, you do what you do on, on, on TV. And that's a pretty high standard. In, but, but, I, but he was absolutely right, because if I'm giving you facts on TV, and then I'm on Twitter, and I don't check my facts, and I'm giving you the wrong information, um, and I'm, um, it, I, I have no problem with giving an opinion when people know that I'm giving an opinion. When I'm writing books or articles or on Twitter, it's fine to give an opinion. But if it's based on facts, it's, it's fine. So be careful with your facts, because this is what we're doing. Social media is, your, is the way you are presenting yourself to the world and if you are lying or making a lot lots of mistakes and not uh, correcting that's a problem and then there's so many things that you can concentrate on um, I would I would try to specialize on something specific as, as you know I I'm an immigrant and and it's something very close to my heart I I've always, I, I've always felt like a stranger, even, even though I've been living in this country for more than 30 years, I still feel like a stranger sometimes. But that gives me a unique perspective. In other words, going back to having your own voice. So I think I've, I've concentrated most of my professional life on immigration, on what it means to be a foreigner, on what happens to foreigners. And, um, and I think, People sometimes listen to me because of that. So those are the two suggestions, the two recommendations that I would give you. Be careful with your facts, treat social media as if it's the most important thing, respect it. Uh, if you make a mistake, correct it immediately. And then try to concentrate on something that 
that you are really good at and that you do understand uh, personal. Mm -hmm. And then money will come later. This, this is not a time to, to, to be a millionaire uh, doing this. Um, I'm sorry to say, but it's, it's very difficult. It is incredibly difficult. Uh, we don't know, many companies do not know how to make money out of social media. Many companies do not know how to monetize um, the millions of viewers that they're getting on, on the internet, on, on their websites. And, but maybe you can help us because you are the first generation that knows how to handle technology much better than we do. I, I bet that you can manage this phone where I'm doing this, this interview much better than, than, than I do. So use it to your advantage um, and, and help us understand how we can monetize uh, this because without being paid, you won't have a job and I won't have a job. I know that we talked about this a little bit. A lot of young Latina and Latino reporters are aspiring reporters are watching and listening right now. And we hear right now with COVID-19, the numbers of their communities being disproportionately affected mm -hmm. uh, by this outbreak. And, and we know that that's something that happens with a lot of issues. So how do you approach this in your coverage to kind of get past the numbers and statistics of, you know, the, the depressing numbers and statistics and kind of make your stories really connect with people beyond that? Well, the, the way you connect to people is, is telling stories, telling personal stories. Um, and making sure that the 330 million Americans understand that we are part of this country. And, and what you're saying is absolutely true. In, in New York City, uh, Latinos are only 29% of the population, but 34% of the cases of, of people dying from coronavirus in New York City are, are Latinos. If you go to Rhode Island, uh, the numbers are even higher. Rhode Island, can you imagine? Um, when it comes to not having health insurance, Latinos are disproportionately affected too. When it comes to um, unemployment, I was, I was checking the, the latest numbers of unemployment and, and one in five Latinos, one in five, can you imagine, um, has lost uh, his or her job uh, in the last two months. So, so when, when you were asking me, what can we do specifically? Well, this is the world that I understand. This is the world where I come from, Erika. This is, this, is, this is not something abstract. Um, I talk to immigrants every single day. I talk to undocumented immigrants every single day. And I do know what's happening in their lives. So I think it is my responsibility to say that it is incredibly cruel uh, for President Trump not to help, not to give a check to and help 10 million undocumented immigrants because look at this contradiction. President Trump says that farm workers and meat packers are essential workers, right? And I think we all agree they are because they're feeding us. We live uh, thanks to them. At the same time, his government has decided not to help at all undocumented immigrants. And many of the farm workers and many of the meat packers uh, are undocumented immigrants. So how come President Trump calls them illegals and at the same time they are essentials? Well, that's a story. There's a story right there. And it is my responsibility. Sorry for this. Okay. I'll, I'll get back to that. It is, it is my, my responsibility to report about what's happening with, with the Latino community. And so that's, that's a unique angle that I have and that many of you have. Uh, and, and use that voice um, because it, it, is, it is incredibly important. Now, um, you might say, well, my life is not really that different or my life is not uh, that unique and I would I would beg to differ. Um, Sandra Cisneros uh, who's just a, one of the best writers that, that I've ever known, um, The House of Mango Streets and many others, 
uh, once she was telling me that whenever she goes to teach a class, she asked the, the future writers, what's the story that you can tell me that nobody else can in this room? And when you find out that, that's a story that I, that I want to hear. So um, when we're covering the pandemic, uh, it is again the, the most devastating crisis in my lifetime and in your lifetime. And you as a reporter, you, you cannot say, well, I don't have a job. I'm not going to do anything about it. I mean, what a waste of time. This is the most important story of our lifetime. And with a job or without a job, it is, this is an incredible opportunity to report on it. And you have a unique perspective. I'm sure you know someone uh, who's sick. You might have a, a neighbor who has a story to tell. Um, when we have a million and a half Americans being affected right now by coronavirus, and many millions more that probably will be affected in, in the future, we have many stories to tell. And, and use that voice, that personal voice, um, to, um, to tell us what's happening in your house. So um, remember, at the end, we are only storytellers. And what we have to do is to find our voice in this crisis um, to let others know what we are seeing. We are the eyes of those who cannot see what we are doing. Mm -hmm. Well, Rebecca, we know we have a lot of questions here. I'll be, I'll be, I'll be quick. Sorry, I'll be. Sure. Oh, that's great. Okay. I've had going into audience now. Um, do you think that the pandemic will change the way that media outlets and particularly broadcasts sort of operates? Do you think that some of the things we're seeing now, like remote interviews and the whole way we've had to change, will extend and become more of a permanent part going forward? even when there's a vaccine. Yeah, I, I think so. Not, it's not only cheaper, it's faster. Maybe the audio that we're having is not as precise as having a, a microphone, but it's, it's already changing the way we work. Uh, unfortunately, it's also giving bad ideas to, um, to, to the owners of uh, mass media in this country in which they're realizing they can do the same job with just a fraction of the cost. Uh, at the same time, the industry is going through a, such a terrible time that they just might um, might start using these uh, more often, and 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 absolutely. Why why do I have to travel all the time with five people, with lights and, and microphones and cameras when sometimes just with a phone uh, would be even more uh, impactful and and just as precise? Yeah, it's 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 already changing the way we work. Mm -hmm. And I know you touched on this a little bit. Um, someone had asked Rebecca Aguilar, what do you say to TV directors and editors in chiefs who say no opinions? They want balanced stories. How do you approach that? They're right, they're right. When I'm doing my job, Erika, I don't give my opinion. I'll, I'll, I'll do a newscast today at 6.30 in an hour and 15 minutes. And I, I promise you that I won't give you my opinion. And if I give my opinion, they'll fire me because they didn't hire me to do the newscast to give my opinion. So they're right in that sense, because we're not being hired to, to give opinions unless you're a commentator and you're hired to do that. Okay, having said that, everybody's incredibly intelligent and they do know that I have points of view. They do know that I'm an immigrant. They do know that I'm from Mexico. They do know that at some point in my career, I had a confrontation with President Trump and that his bodyguard ejected me from a press conference. The only other person who's done something like that, it was Fidel Castro, a dictator. So do I have points of view? Yes. Do I have opinions? Yes. But we have to be very transparent to tell the people what is it that we are doing. If you're reading one of my books, or if you read one of my tweets, or if you check uh, the the the, the Real America show that I'm doing on, on Facebook, you are expecting a point of view. You are expecting my opinion, uh, what I told you about undocumented immigrants. And, and, and uh, you're expecting what, what, I, what I think. So I think news directors are, are right by telling you, do not give me 
your opinion on the air. If you wanna give your opinion off the air, uh, on your time, for your books, for your tweet feed, you can do it, but you have to tell the people exactly what you're doing. I think you'll, you'll respect me. You know I have a point of view, Erika, but, but I don't think you wanna hear my point of view on the air. Right now is the time to give you a point of view, but not, but not on the air. Mm -hmm. It's a balancing act. And Joanna Falavani has a question. She says, as a bilingual reporter who, when you were first starting off with your career, did you anticipate that you would be working in a language other than your native Spanish too? No, you know, I, as you know, I have an accent and I believe me, I, I've tried to improve it as much as I can and it's now impossible. I learned English too late in my life. And, and it's funny because my kids, they constantly correct me when I speak English. But at the same time, I've been living in this country for more than 30 years and I wanna have a, I want to have a say. I, I, when, when people talk about Latinos and when people talk about immigrants um, and communities of color, I want to be there. I mean, I want to participate. I want to be, I want to fully participate. So no, I never expected uh, that I would be doing a show in, in English, even, even with, an, with an accent. But what I've noticed lately, uh, and lately, I mean, in the last few years, is that while an accent was not accepted 30 years ago, I still remember a news director in Los Angeles in the early 1980s told me, I he told me, Jorge, you would never work in English in this country. Uh, and said, well, thank you very much for that. Well, he lost his job and I got mine. But, but the fact is that uh, accents are accepted now more than ever in the United States. And, and think about it, in 2044, everyone in this country is going to be part of a minority. Uh, we are gonna be in a minority-majority country or majority-minority country, any way you wanna do it. Um, this country is becoming more and more diverse than ever, despite what Donald Trump wants to do, and despite the fact that the borders right now are closed, and despite the fact of Stephen Spencer and, and all the people who wanna stop immigration. And it is simply impossible because the change is already coming from within the Hispanic community and from within the immigrants communities. Mm -hmm. I have a, a really interesting question here. Um, you've covered many difficult and challenging stories, a lot of deaths, a lot of natural disasters. So how have you kind of balanced or processed your own, the own personal impact that those kind of stories will inevitably have? Um, and are you able to show up, how are you able to show up to your job the next day and after you know, a, tr a tragic story one day and showing up the next to do it all over again? Well, um, I think we all need therapy. <laughs> it's, it, is, it, is not, it is not easy. I, there's a, a beautiful story by Augusto Monterroso. Uh, it's, it, it's called the, the shortest story in, in Spanish. And in, in Spanish it goes like this. Uh, Cuando se despertó, el dinosaurio todavía estaba allí. Uh, and the story goes like, like this. When he woke up, the dinosaur was still there. It's supposed to be the shortest story in, in Spanish language by Augusto Monterroso. And many, many mornings, um, Erika, when I wake up, I feel exactly like that. I wake up and I wanna think that it's a, it's a nightmare. And it is not. The virus is still there outside of my home, right there. And, and it's affecting me. It's affecting everyone. I'm afraid, as, as you are. And, but, but I've been able to come to work and to do interviews. Um, I, after two months coming to the newsroom, I've learned how to do it without getting infected and still, maybe just by touching the keyboard or, or by leaving my office at some point, I, I might get it. But um, the, this is a story, we're not thinking about it because we're right in the middle of it. But the, the emotional and the mental consequences of, of this pandemic are immense. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we have to be humble enough to, to say, I am afraid, I am afraid. Uh, and 
um, and even, of course, I, I was not hired to to cry on the air, and I won't. But um, but I am afraid of my family. I have an 86 year old mom. Uh, she lives in in Mexico City, and I can't see her. And even if I can fly to Mexico City, I wouldn't be able to touch her. Um, when um, when my father died, I was here in Miami, and I still cannot um, cannot understand what what the hell was I doing in in Miami while while my dad was was dying in Mexico City, and um, I'm so afraid of and scared of the possibility that something like that might happen to to my family in Mexico. So it it is okay. Brian Stelter from CNN used, uh, said recently, it is okay not to be okay. And, and not, we're not okay. This is not normal. What we are living is not normal. Um, so we have to, to accept that. And at the same time, as, as journalists, we have to take advantage of that opportunity uh, and to report about probably the most interesting and devastating time um, in our careers. Yeah, I would take uh, about two more questions. I know you have a newscast to get to uh, coming up on mm -hmm. 4.30. Um, someone had asked, what advice would you give, how did you personally develop your writing and your storytelling skills? I've, I, I've been reading lately Ernest Hemingway again, and and I just read a, a beautiful book about uh, his last interviews. What I, what I really appreciate about him is the brevity and the, clar the clarity of his writing. And the, the way I personally develop my own, my own style on the air and in writing, I, I want to make sure, Erika, that, that you do understand what I want to say the first time. And if I say something, and you don't understand it the first time, I gotta change it, it doesn't, it doesn't work. So the most important thing is, well, we, we talked about the importance of the facts and, and reporting reality as it is, not as, as you wish it would be and challenging authority and everything, but at the end, it's also a technique. And, the, and you have to be, you have to know how to communicate what you think and do it in, in, in very simple, clear terms. That's my style. I, I, I want to make sure that you do understand what I'm trying to say the first time. And that, and, and also, and, and this is fine, I'm always looking for an audience. I, I remember talking to, uh, to Barbara Walters before, before she retired. Uh, I was invited to the view and, and she was right there sitting by me which was a great honor. And she had in some cards, the promotion for her special that night. And I remember going to a commercial break and, 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 she, and I asked her, uh, Ms. Walters, why are you still promoting your special? I mean, you've been doing this for decades. You're the best known journalist uh, on, on TV. Why, why do you still need to do that? And she, she said something like, uh, well, because if I don't promote it, Nobody else is going to watch it. We, we, are, we have to understand that we are doing this, that we are journalists, because we want people to know what we think. And we want people to know what we are reporting. And that's the nature of this industry. If you don't want people to know what you're doing, you can just write whatever, whatever you have, put it in paper, and, and, uh, and keep it under your blankets. But uh, this is not a business to be silent. This is a business to be heard. This is a business when you have to find your voice and make sure that you speak up and speak out because that's what this society is expecting from us, especially when we are challenging uh, authority and precedence. I think lastly, we'll, we'll end on here. Do you, as journalists, we're often told, I mean, we're told it constantly um, in broadcast, do you have to start off in a small market to be a reporter? Not anymore. You can start at, the, the beauty of it, 
I, I started in a local market. I started in, in Los Angeles in the local station. And then I became an anchor in the local station. And then I became a, um, a reporter for the network. And, and I move up and I paid my dues. But you don't have to pay your dues because the, the beauty is that with social media and with the internet and with websites, um, you don't have to wait 40 years or 30 years as I did. You can start right away. You can start, you can get a, a, a top job at a network right now if they think you are good. Um, just see, see how young the, the reporters are nowadays. Um, and why are they hiring you? I, especially, I see the, the great reporters on, a, on ABC News. Um, why are they hiring me so young? Well, because they're very good. Because they, um, they had a experience. They can be as good as any other reporter. They don't have to be 60 like me to, to ask tough, tough questions. They have a, they're very good at, at reporting. They're very good at interviewing. Um, they communicate very directly. Uh, and they have a fantastic social media presence. So no, you don't have to wait. You don't have to go to a small market to start. You can start right away, right now with this conversation. You can just stop your phone, uh, go out and start reporting, uh, which is the beauty of, of it. And let me just finish with this. I know that many of you don't have a job right now or are looking for a job and many companies are firing people, not hiring people. Um, but, but I encourage you, I, I, I please, uh, take advantage of this moment because this pandemic right now is the defining moment in our generation, in your generation. This is a defining moment. And, and if you want to be a reporter, take advantage and do it right now. Uh, I, I was telling Erica in, uh, that during this pandemic, uh, hundreds of people work at Univision. And, and we sent many of them home to, to protect themselves. Um, and while we were asking them to stay home, many of them kept on coming to the newsroom. And they say, no, 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 I, I want to work. I, I need to be here. Well, that's, that's precisely the spirit of a reporter. Uh, a reporter needs to be where the news is. And the news is all over our, all over ourselves right now. It's is just a few feet away from where you are right now. Uh, so um, take advantage of that. I mean, it would be it might might sound too strong, but but if you don't feel compelled to report about this pandemic right now you might want to think about other professions. Mm -hmm. no, th this is, it, it, it's as, as if you are in front of a war and you decide not to cover it. Or it, it's as if you are a reporter, 9-11, 2001, and then you don't want to cover it. I cannot, uh, th there are many reasons why you might decide to do that. Uh, and I respect that. But if you're a reporter, um, you need to cover this. This is the, the most important story of your lifetime. And you cannot, it doesn't matter if you're 19 or 20 or 25 or 30 or 62 like me, uh, you have to cover it. Um, being paid or not paid, it doesn't matter. Because I can see your stories and many people are gonna be able to see your stories um, right, right now. So take advantage of that. Um, money will come later. Don't worry about it, it, it doesn't matter. That's not the most important thing. The most important thing as a reporter is to cover the story uh, and tell me what you see, because what you are seeing is not what I'm seeing. And it is important to tell that story. Use your voice. Again, uh, speak up and speak out. This is, this is your time to be a reporter. Uh, 30, 40 years from now, you're gonna regret yourself if you, if, to think that you lived through this and you didn't report about it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And you've got a new show to get to. We really appreciate your time. 
it's definitely helpful advice to everyone who's been contemplating what to do right now. So thank you so much, Jorge. Thank you, Erika. Thanks, everyone. Gracias. Adiós. Bye.